and Cassie, we were told, had a book coming out in about a year, and that we should have her back for that event. So we had Holly and Cassie together, and it was a great success, and Holly had this huge long line of people who already knew her books, and Cassie had a nice little following, and people came up and wanted a book now and then. And about a year later, we had Cassie back for City of Ash, the combined into City of Bones, and it was now, Holly couldn't make it, so we had some other authors with her, and it was, it was Cassie who had the long, long line, and the other authors who were getting a little bit here and there. So, in addition to passing it along, they have very kindly invited their friend Lauren, who is her very first book as a debut author, and we're very excited. We always love having first time authors here. And how many of you like trilogies? Yeah. <laughs> there is the first book in a trilogy. So you're, got, you're, you're in on the ground floor, folks. You all have a chance to say, I read it before anyone knew about it. And you can be smug as you want to all the people who think they were in, but you were there before. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Holly and Cassie and Lauren and let them do their thing. Will was one of the few who could. 
As he approached the old cemetery, their voices rose in a ragged musical chorus. This was not a peaceful burial ground, but Will knew that. It was not his first visit to the Crossbones graveyard. He did his best to block out the noise, hunching his shoulders, so that his collar covered his ears, his head down, a fine mist of rain dampening his black hair. The entrance to the cemetery was halfway down the block, a pair of wrought iron gates set into a high stone wall. Any Monday in passing by could see the thick chain that bound the gates shut and the sign declaring the premises closed. It had been 15 years since the body was buried here, but the place itself remained as yet undesecrated. As Will neared the gates, something no mundane would have seen materialized out of the fog. A knocker in the shape of a hand, the figure's skeletal. Will reached out with his own gloved hands and lifted the knocker, letting it fall once, twice, three times. For several long moments, nothing happened. Beyond the gates, Will saw mist, rising like steam from the ground, obscuring the grave markers and the long, uneven plots of earth beneath, between them. Slowly, the mist began to rise and coalesce, taking on an eerie blue glow. Will put his hands to the bars of the gate. The cold of the metal seeped through his gloves and his bones. It was more than an ordinary cold. When ghosts rose, they drew energy from their surroundings, depriving the air and the space around them of heat. The hair on the back of Will's neck prickled and stood up as the blue mist formed into the shape of an old woman in a ragged dress. Hello, Molly, said Will. You're looking fine this evening, if I do say so. The ghost raised her head. Old Molly was a strong spirit, one of the stronger Will had encountered. Even as moonlight speared through the clouds, she hardly looked transparent. William Harrendale, she said, back again so soon. Will leaned against the gate. You know I missed your pretty face? She grinned, and he saw the skull through her half-transparent skin. Overhead, the clouds closed in, black and roiling, blocking out the moon. Idly, Will wondered what Molly had done to get herself buried here, far from consecrated ground. She chortled. What do you want, young shadow hunter? Malthus venom? Talons of a Morax demon? No, Will said. That's not what I need. I need fry demon powders. Ground up fine. Molly paled, if a ghost could have paled, as Will spoke. Will exhaled, his breath turning to mist on the cold air. Surely, he said, that's hardly the worst thing anyone's ever paid you for. It was always like this. She pretended to argue, but she gave in eventually. Magnus had already sent Will to Molly several times, once for black, stinking candles that stuck to his skin like tar, once for the bones of an unborn child, and once for a bag of fairy eyes that dripped blood on his shirt. She slid her hands into the pouch at the front of her apron. When she moved them, she was holding a faded cloth bag tied with a scrap of dirty ribbon. This is a trap, isn't it? Some kind of trick. This is, you Nephilim catch me selling this sort of stuff, and it's the stick for me it is. You're already dead, Will said. I don't know what you think the clay could do to you now. Ha, her hollow eyes flamed. The presence of the silent brothers can hold the living or the dead. Will held his hands up. This is no trick. Surely you must have heard the rumors and that running around downworld. The clave has other things on its mind than tracking down ghosts who traffic in demon power and fairy blood. He leaned forward. I'll give you a good price. He drew a cambric bag from his pocket and dangled it in the air. It clinked like coins rather than together. They all fit your description. An eager look came over her dead face. She solidified enough to take the bag from him. She plunged one hand into it and brought her palm out full of rings. Gold wedding rings. Old Molly, like many ghosts, was always looking for that talisman, that lost piece of her past that would allow her to die. In her case, it was her wedding ring. It was common belief, Magnus had said to Will, that the ring was long gone, buried under the silty bed of the Thames. But in the meantime, she'd take any bag of found rings on the hope one would turn out to be hers. So far, it hadn't happened. She dropped the rings back in the bag, which vanished somewhere on her undead person, and handed him a full chassis of powder in return. He slipped it into his jacket pocket, just as the ghost began to shimmer and fade. Hold up, that's not all I've come for, Molly. Very well. What else do you want? Will hesitated. This was not something Magnus had sent him for. It was something he wanted for himself. Love potions. Molly screamed with laughter. Love potions for you. It's not my way to turn down payment, but anyone who looks like you doesn't need a love potion, and that's a fact. <laughs> no, Will said. I, I was looking for the opposite, something that might put an end to being in love. A hatred potion. I was hoping for something more like indifference, or a toleration potion. <laughs> she made a snorting noise. I hardly like to tell you this, Nephilim, but if you want a girl to hate you, there's easy ways of making that happen. You don't need my help. <laughs> and with that, she vanished, spinning away into the mist among the graves, Will looking after her side. Not for her, he said, under his breath, though there was no one to hear him. For me.
Red Blood, which is the second book in my new series. Uh, it's called The Curse Workers. Um, and it is kind of a romantic, Moorish crime fantasy. So, yeah, I know, lots of, lots of you know, a common genre. Um, so I'm going to read you a very little bit to kind of give you a feeling for the world, and then I'm going to read you a little bit of smut. Um, I, I, I try to start with um, Alright. <clears throat> Cons aren't glamorous. They're hauling out the ancient vacuum from the closet, changing the bag, and making sure you get up most of the dust. They're sweeping in the basement to hide that you were recently rolling around after a transformation. They're field stripping the gun, according to instructions on the internet, and carefully buffing off any fingerprints with a lightly oiled cloth, then wrapping the whole thing in paper towels. They're driving a mile to an abandoned stretch of road and soaking a murderous coat and gloves with enough lighter fluid that they burn to ash. They're waiting to make sure they burn to ash, and then scattering that ash. They're smashing any remaining buttons from the coat with a hammer, then tossing them along with the vacuum bag and any hooks or metal parts in different dumpsters far from where you burned the clothes. Cons are all in the details. And now the smoke. <laughs> so, what you need to know about this is that um, our hero, Castle Sharp, has been in love with a girl, and that girl has been cursed to be in love with him, which is why he shouldn't be doing any of the things he's about to do. <laughs> she flops back on the grass, looking up at the night sky. I like how you can see stars out here in the country. This isn't the country, I say, turning toward her. We're close to two cities, and she smiles up at me, and all of a sudden we're in dangerous territory. I'm above her, looking down at the fall of her silvery hair on the grass, at the way her neck moves when she swallows nervously, at the way her fingers curl in the dirt. I try to say something, but I can't remember what we were talking about. All my thoughts melt away as her lips part and her bare hand slides through my hair, pulling me down to her. She makes a soft sound as my mouth presses against hers, hungry, desperate. Only a monster would do this, but I already know I'm a monster. I roll toward her, not breaking the kiss, crushing her body against mine. My eyes close so I don't have to see what I'm doing, but my hands find her easily enough. Her fingers are still knotted in my hair, gripping it hard, like she's afraid I'm going to pull away. Please, I say breathlessly, but then we're kissing again and it's hard to concentrate on anything, but the feel of her body arching under mine and I never get the rest of the words out. Please stop me. I drag my mouth away from hers, moving to kiss the hollow of her throat, my teeth gliding over her skin, my tongue tasting sweat and dirt. Castle, she whispers. She said my name a hundred times before, a thousand times, but never like this. I pull back abruptly, never like this. She rises with me, but now at least we're both sitting up. That helps. She's breathing hard, her eyes black with pupil. I don't, I start. It's not, it's not real. The words make no sense. I shake my head to clear it. She looks at me with an expression I cannot name. Her lips are slightly apart and swollen. We have to go back, I say finally. Okay. I can barely hear the word. Her voice is all breath. I nod, pushing myself to my feet. I reach out my hand, and she lets me pull her up. For a moment, her hand is in mine, warm and bare. At the window to my room, I catch my reflection in the glass. Shaggy black hair, sneer. I look like a hungry ghost, glowering in at a world I am no longer fit to be part of. And my protagonist, Ryan, is told through her eyes, and 
she is just trying to get back home to her twin brother, um, who is the only family she has. And in a world where few people live past 20 or 25, with the exception of a first generation that has lived to old age, it's very rare for people to have families. So many of the girls who are kidnapped, they either never are able to escape, or they really have no reason to escape. And I've heard this, um, I've heard whether it's called a love story, I've heard it called a dystopia, I've heard it called many things, and none of those things are wrong. Um, but as, at its core, and when I wrote it, I wrote it to be a story of a girl who was just trying to get home. And when I started writing this, I actually thought it would be a short story. I didn't know where it was going to go. I'm not much of an outliner or a planner. I very much just shoot from the hip. So um, I knew at the start of the story, the opening really hasn't changed from the original content, what you read. It's been very, like, the, the opening has been very mildly edited. Um, and all I knew starting the story was that there was a girl, I didn't know her name, I didn't know what she looked like, I didn't know where she'd come from, I just knew she was in a dark place, she was scared of where she was going, and she wanted to get home. And I just went from there. And it seems now, um, at, now that I'm in the third book, although only the first book is published right now, um, that that is the main theme. She's got a one-track mind, she's got this one goal, she is constantly trying to work towards. And, um, I get a lot of questions asking me how I came up with such an idea, and I don't really know. That's the honest truth. I, I think it's just when I write, I'm not thinking of any particular story. There are many things I've read, many things I've seen on the news that have inspired me, and I think it all just gets together to a big brain cloud in my head, and when I'm writing, I'm using parts of my brain that I may not necessarily access on a conscious level normally. And one thing that comes to mind is that several years ago, I know they had started genetically engineering food. And I heard a story, I don't know how true this is, somebody might have to look it up, but I heard a story about how somebody, they had genetically modified a potato to not have carbs. And as a result, somebody who had been healthy, somebody, some healthy person who had no known food allergies had an allergic reaction and died. And I think that planted kind of a seed in my head that, you know, if we mess with things, but we make them completely unnatural to us, we're creating new problems. And that's not to say that we shouldn't try new things, that's definitely not. Because I am fascinated to see where technology goes, where things go, how things change. And then there's also the topic of polygamy, um, because these women, they are groups, and they are married off to one man so that they can try to produce more children quickly. And I think that's part of the reason for marriage, rather than just having them hen, is I think marriage takes away their freedom even more because they're not even expected to openly dislike their situation. It's like they've been brought into a wealthy household with sister wives and they're given you know, luxuries if they're lucky and my protagonist Ryan is lucky enough to have those things. And they're expected to like it. And the husband that they're given is you know, who they are committed to. They're meant to be with that person. And it's, it's almost like a worse insult than just being kidnapped and calling it what it is. And I think all of these elements came together and that's how the story was born. And it, I intended it to be a short story and when I got maybe a hundred or so pages in, I realized, okay, this obviously isn't going to be a short story. In fact, I don't think I can wrap it up into one book. And having finished the first book, I just all of a sudden started thinking of new antics and adventures for my characters to get into in the next story. And it just continues on and on. And I think that's the story of how winter came to be. <laughs>